Well, good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. We're glad to see you this morning. I have got a host, and by when I say a host, I mean a plethora of announcements this morning. And uh, so most of them are in our church bulletin. A few of them are uh, added, so uh, we need to share some of those with you today. Um, of course, today, this evening, is our annual fall festival. Remember, we are doing things a little bit different this year. We are having a children's candy walk around our building, and uh, we've got a lot of folks who've signed up to help us. If you are interested, we are going to feed those who are helping from 4 o'clock until 421. Good job. At 421, you show up at 422, I am not feeding you. I don't care if you walk out of here and don't like me. All right, because at 436, we are gathering for prayer. And eating a hot dog is not as important as prayer and preparing for our night. So uh, show up, we'll feed you if you'd like at about 4 o'clock to 421. And uh, we'll feed you hot dog chips and drink, and then we'll gather for prayer and assign stations. Uh, we've got plenty of candy. We're grateful for those who have brought in candy. Uh, we do need a little bit of help. Um, if you have a flashlight, bring a flashlight with you tonight and bring a jacket because it is going to be cool this evening. We are looking forward to it. It's going to be a great time together this evening. Also, church family. Um, unless you are physically uh, handicapped in some way, don't park in the park, the paved parking lot. Either park on the grass over here, behind the building, not in between, because we're going to have a lot of pedestrians walking through there, or on the other side of the sanctuary. We want to leave the parking lot for our guests and those who will be coming for our candy walk tonight. So going to look forward to it. It's going to be a great time tonight, having an opportunity to minister to a lot of our area kids tonight. So can't wait. It's going to be a great time. Several things going on in the course of the next week. Wednesday night, we begin our Wednesday night activities, finally. Yes. We're beginning with dinner. Wednesday night supper kicks back off. Jack and Mildred are fixing a great dinner for us. However... We haven't had Wednesday night supper for about a year and a half, so we need to get an idea how many folks will be here Wednesday night. There's a sign-up sheet on the table in the back back there. Please, if you're coming, sign up so we have a general idea of about how many folks are coming. So make sure that you get on the list back there for Wednesday night supper. Also on Wednesday night, our adult choir is going to meet. Um, they have not met very often in the last year and a half. Choir, you're going to meet this morning at the end of service over in the sanctuary for a few minutes. So choir in the sanctuary after the service today and then Wednesday night after prayer meeting and Bible study. Also this week, we've got you Sunday night. We've got you Wednesday night. Thursday night is ladies' Bible study, 6 o'clock for all ladies. That's here in the Family Life Center. I got something special for Saturday. How many here will give me a dollar for a whole extra hour's sleep Saturday night? Yeah, I got a few of you that would be honest enough. Don't forget to change your clock Saturday night. This Saturday night, change your clock. In preparation for homecoming next Sunday, a week from today, it is going to be awesome. We're going to be back in the sanctuary for worship next Sunday morning. Yes, it is going to be awesome. We're also going to have dinner on the grounds. When we're done, the church is taking care of the meat and the drink, so bring a covered dish to go along with that. And that's coming up next Sunday. And then two weeks from today. I'm just full of good announcements today. Two weeks from today, we're going to begin Sunday morning refreshments before Sunday school. So we'll be back on track with refreshments for Sunday morning beginning two weeks from today, the Sunday after homecoming. All right, then when service is over today, gentlemen, if you're in the choir, you get excused for choir practice. If you are not in the choir, 
we need some help moving tables and chairs. We have got to take all these chairs. We've got to move all of them. We've got to set up tables for tonight, for Wednesday night, for next Sunday. So we're going to need some help. Uh, Frog will help, be, help directing that. As you know, Brother Frog, he's rather OCD. So don't just willy-nilly start grabbing chairs. But we'll direct you afterwards. So got a lot we got to do coming up. So help us out when we are finished today. And I got one other awesome announcement. I had the privilege last week to see a video. We are involved in Operation Shoebox, as most of you know, and have been all year long. Uh, we've heard from a number of the kids that we've sent packages to around the world. And I got to see a video this last week of one of our boxes, especially a box with a pair of sandals in it. And it is awesome, and we want to share that with you this morning. Here we go. In a language, to unquale, not in quale. Wazangu alikuwa na pesa mpaka ikabilikia aka ana ila kunulia mie viatu. Mdi mkeni kwa nana ata hibu kwa nashukeni. Wazangu wata alikuwa na nicheka. Kwa sabu nikuwa sina viatu. Nikuwa na kina shuleni walimu wana nipigia. Mdi mkeni kwa nana pia Nuli nyumbani. Paka nikana ona haibu kwenda shuleni. Asi, ile hali ya inumiza sana dana ya mwe wangu. Nika sema, mungu naifanya njia. Naomba ufanya njia. Tulingia kwenye maombi. Mungu wakana sidi kuntia mwe kwa mba. Etuendele kumba mungu watatini. Kusabu alikuwa ni mda mlefu, nikiwa naambia, naambia, sipa alikipata hila, nikiwa nafunjika mwe. Nipo shikini ya kana letia maazo mbali mbali mabali. Sometimes kwa maazo nakuja, niende laba, nikaombe mtani. Oh, I can't be so fun. Ni pukwa na kenda kani sani. Ni kwa na ndoto kwa vetu mungu na enda kini ni kwa sina mwa kenda kani sani. Kini kumwa ni penda kani sani. Ega kuta kuna zozo gani na boku sasa. Wale akawa mmoja hapo, wale watoto walupiwa boksi la zawadi. Wada kufika nyumbani, akalifungu. Sikuwa hamidi kijo kwa ndani ya boksi. Wala katua viatu, havi kumbana, wala havi kumpuaya. Ni saizi kabizi. Nipo fungu wale boksi la zawadi, nilikuwa nilipata fula sana. I was like, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you, 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 I'm going to tell you. I was able to get a safe place. 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 I was able to get a 
kwa huyo mtu ambaye kama aliona kwamba kuna mtoto ambaye anahitaji la viatu. Atukuelewa ndani ya box ulikuwa kuna nini? Ingawa kwa mwingine ulionekana kama ni mdogo kwangu niliona mkubwa sana. Nikasema hakika Mungu wewe ndio unaitenda mimi. If you're wondering what part will my box or could my box play in somebody's life, what an awesome testimony. Donna's got a few things to say about our Operation Shoe Box. First off, also next Sunday after a worship service, we are going to be taking our church family picture outside. Come with your smiles. Um, that picture will go in every one of our boxes and it will be from Waldo First Baptist. So make sure you hang around a few minutes. The drone man is gonna have his drone out there and take our family picture. So, and I will have copies for you all also, but we pack a picture in every one of our boxes along with a note. How many of you have needed or wanted something lately and you couldn't get it? Hmm. This young man, oh, a new young man. This young man <laughs> who needed a pair of shoes. He got them because a box showed up and God gave him a pair of shoes. We have 281 shoes paid for. We are just shy of a few more to meet our goal of 300. We are sending shoes that can grow and be passed on to thousands of kids. I mean, it's going around the world and somebody's gonna get something that they need. Not only are they getting the physical pair of shoes, they're going to get a gospel opportunity. That's right. The gospel opportunity not only meets the needs of maybe that one child, but this guy's father saw what God did. His mother believed and encouraged him to go to church. This box can reach eight to nine people and tell them about the gospel and the good news. This is why we pack shoe boxes. So far we have 131 up here. Our goal is still 300, and I would like for it to be more than 300. Our OCC store has everything you need to pack a box, from wow gifts to a pair of shoes to little odds and ends, toothbrushes and everything. If you come to our OCC store after church or this Wednesday night when we come and gather again, we can help you pack that box. We also need help with our postage, $9.00. Nine dollars will ship this box to somewhere. That young man was in Tanzania. Our boxes went next door to Tanzania last year. Also, next Sunday is when we would love for your box to show back up if you have some at home. If you have a box at home that you wish to send, if you will bring it next Sunday, we will start collecting them. We will be praying over our boxes in two Sundays. We will have them all in the sanctuary, and we are going to pray over these boxes, and we are going to ask God to get them to those who need them. So put that in your mind, and then on the 15th or si on the 16th, they're going to go to, the, to Trinity Baptist over in Keystone where they will get ready to be shipped to the processing center. We are coming down to the last two weeks of our boxes, you guys, and you have been amazing in getting our 281 shoes. God is amazing, and we are a part of this. Right. So I want to thank you, and if you have any questions, ask me or Brenda. Shop at the store. It's a great place. Good bargains. That's right. What an opportunity to share the gospel somewhere in the world. We don't even know where these are going yet, but we see an example of what God can do through one of our shoe boxes. Miss Donna is even so excited. Miss Donna is not only following our shoe boxes from here to Trinity and Keystone, She's also following those boxes, and she's spending her Thanksgiving vacation up at the main center in North Carolina to help pack boxes to be shipped overseas. So, I know. 
So what an awesome opportunity. We want to take some time to welcome and visit with one another. We hope you'll put a nice smile on your face as we share not our last welcome song, but at least our last welcome song in this building today. So let's share a welcome song together this morning. All right, while you're going back to your places, when you get there, you may be seated. Two other quick announcements. Ushers, don't forget to wear your usher shirts next to Sunday morning. And also, circle ladies, you have meeting tomorrow morning. We didn't get it in the bulletin, but circle meeting tomorrow morning, 10 o'clock, ladies. Work, 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 Donna says, but I know there'll be food. So circle meeting tomorrow morning. All right, as we go to the Lord in prayer this morning, do have a couple of praise reports. Barbara Shaw is home recuperating, so continue to lift her up from your prayers. Stephanie, of course, out of the hospital here this morning, a praise report. And then also got a good praise report from Dan and Tony this morning. She continues to do so well, working so hard at her therapy. In fact, so well this morning, they shared with them that on present course, if everything goes well, she will get to go home this Friday. So what a blessing. Yes, that's absolutely incredible. So what a joy. Let's pray together this morning. Father, we rejoice. We have so many things to be thankful for. You've given us the privilege to be able to come to your house and worship you today. You've blessed us with another day. And while every day is your day, this is a special day. Because we do gather and we do come to glorify you. We are grateful for the praise reports we're able to share this morning. God, you are the healer, Jehovah Rapha. And God, I pray that as we share our time together in your word and lifting you up in praise, that it will be genuine from our hearts. And Father, I pray that as we have an opportunity to share your love this afternoon and this evening with folks in our community, that they'll be able to see and hear your love. Bless every part of that time together tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are here to worship him this morning. Join us as we, we give him all the praise and worship. There's great and mighty Lord our God. Joyful sound, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, 
assignment. Surely it was through. But since when has impossible ever stopped you? Friday's disappointment, and Sunday's empty too. Since when has impossible ever stopped you? Is the sound of dry bones rattling. This is the praise making dead man walk again. Open the grave, I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. This is the sound of dry bones rattling. Open the grave, I'm coming out. I'm 
Aren't you glad we serve the God that can do the impossible? Amen. 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 He can even turn a microphone on. I invite you to open the Bibles this morning to the book of 1 Kings, chapter 17. We're going to be looking at 1 Kings, chapter 17 and 18, and are continuing our series on heroes of the faith. And I suppose if you were to look through the Bible to find a passage of Scripture that describes what you and I think of a hero as, this is probably the story that may epitomize what you and I think of a hero. The story, a familiar one probably to you, of Elijah against the prophets of Baal on the mountain called Carmel. 1 Kings chapter 17, we're going to read verse 1, then we're going to be going to verse chapter 18. So when you find 1 Kings chapter 17 and verse 1 in your copy of God's Word, I would invite you out of reverence to God's word to bow your head with me this morning. Even more so, I would invite you to bow your head before God. And take the next few moments of quiet meditation and invite God to speak to your heart this morning. Take a few moments in prayer, then I'll lead us in a word of prayer and read our text. Father, you are the God that can do the impossible. My mind thinks this morning of one of our members in a rehab center walking. You are the God that can do the impossible. I think this morning of this preacher who stands before this congregation and know that you are the God that can do the impossible. You can save me and use me. And God, I pray that as we spend time in your precious word this morning, that every single person in this place today will know that you can do the impossible. Bless the time in your word, in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Kings chapter 17 and verse 1, the Bible says, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto King Ahab, as the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain for these years, but according to my word. Now, if you would, skip to chapter 18 and verse 17. A period of time involving at least several months in all likelihood, probably a couple of years have passed. Chapter 18, verse 17, And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Are you he who troubles Israel? And Elijah answered and said, I have not troubled Israel, but you, you and your father's house, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and you have followed Baal. Now therefore send and gather to me and, and all of Israel to Mount Carmel. And the prophets of Baal, 450. The prophets of the idols, 400, who eat at your wife Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel, and he gathered them and all the prophets together on Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people, and he said, How long do you stop between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Then Elisha said to the people, I, only I, remain a prophet unto the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let them therefore give us two bulls, 
And let us each choose one, and let's cut them into pieces, lay it on the wood, put no fire in it. I will prepare the other bull. I will lay it on the wood and put no fire under it. And you will call upon the name of your gods, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, it's well spoken. And Elisha said unto the prophets of Baal, Choose you one bullock for yourself and prepare it first, for you are many. And call upon the name of your gods, but do not put any fire under it. And they took the bullock which was given to them and they prepared it. And from morning until noon they cried, saying, O oh, Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, none that answered. And they began leaping upon the altar which was made. It came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them, and he said, Cry louder, for he's a god. Either he's talking, or he's pursuing. Maybe he's on a journey. Maybe he's asleep and needs to be awakened. And they cried aloud. They cut themselves after their manner with swords and lances until the blood gushed out of them. And it came to pass, when the midday was past, that they continued to prophesy until the offering of the evening sacrifice. And there was neither voice, nor any to answer, nor any that even regarded and Elisha said unto all the people, Come near to me. And all the people came near. He repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Elijah took twelve stones according to the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel will be your name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. He made a trench around the altar, a trench that would contain two large measures of seed. He put the wood in the order. He cut the bull into pieces. He laid it on the wood. And then he said, fill four barrels with water and pour it on the sacrifice and on the wood. And he said, do it a second time. They did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. And the water ran around the altar and it filled up the trench with water. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet he came near and said Lord God of Abraham Isaac and Israel let it be known this day that you are God in Israel that I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word hear me O Lord hear me that this people will know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their heart back again. And the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice. It consumed the wood and the stones and the dust and it licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal and let not one of them escape. And they took them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishron. And he slew them there. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his precious word. When you think about a hero, you think about a story with oftentimes one person who stands alone against incredible odds. In our story today, we see that. We have one prophet of God, Elijah, who stands on Mount Carmel against 850 of the prophets of Baal. And he stands alone. We also recognize from the story that while it's not implied or told at the beginning of the story, it is in the story to know that the person who wins the competition that day stays alive. And the one who loses dies. 
We call someone a hero when they stand against incredible odds, when they face unbelievable adversity. And Elijah stands there with 850 prophets, and he calls upon God and says, God, let them know that you are God in Israel and not Baal. And the text implies to us knowing that if God does not answer in fire, we already know what Ahab had said. Ahab, the king, his wife Jezebel, even more angry at, at Elijah, and said, I will kill the man. You face 850 to 1 odds, that's pretty good. But you face the odds of knowing that if you lose, you die. And a hero is someone who risks their life against incredible odds. And so let's share our outline. It's simple, just like it's been. The story, the victory, and the lessons. The story is pretty simple. We just read it. It's not real difficult to understand. Ahab is the king of Israel. His wife is Jezebel. They are incredibly evil. In fact, the Bible tells us more evil than any of the kings that went before them. And we know as evil as Ahab was, his wife was even more evil. Months, perhaps two years earlier, God had told Elijah to go to Ahab and tell him that God is going to bring down judgment upon Israel and it is going to stop raining. There's not going to be rain. There's not going to be dew. And all the rain and all the dew stops. And the nation of Israel is in a very difficult time. There's very little water. There's very little crops. Food is scarce. There's a famine. And Ahab and Jezebel have determined, you know what? That is Elijah's fault and we're going to take him out. And then God sends Elijah back to Ahab and says, you gather all of the prophets of Baal and you come to Mount Carmel. We're going to have a showdown to find out whether Baal is God or Jehovah is God. And by the way, just so you know, in the temple at that time, they not only inside the Jewish temple, they also had in the temple and around the temple idols to other gods. They were convinced they could worship God and Baal. The problem is we know what happens when you do that. You don't go to God, you end up going away from God and they have served Baal. And of course, Elijah calls them to the top of the mountain and says, you build an altar, I'll build an altar. You put a sacrifice on it, I'll put a sacrifice. You put wood, I'll put wood. And then we'll pray to our gods and whichever one calls fire down from heaven, we'll know that that's the real God. And guess what they all said? Yeah. You know what the people said that day? Put up or shut up. Well, it was translated different out of the Hebrew. But it was that. Let's see. Now everybody's there. Everybody can see. I love the story. I, we, I wish we had time to get into it because it's one of my favorite stories in all the Bible. And if you don't think God has a sense of humor, you read this story and you realize that God has a sense of humor. You don't have to look far to know that God has a sense of humor. If you don't think so, look at the person on your right and left. And you'll realize that God still has a sense of humor. But I love it. They begin in the morning praying to their God. And they pray till noon. And nothing is happening. And Elijah begins to mock them. He begins to say, maybe your God is asleep. You better cry louder. He needs to be awake. Maybe he's on vacation. Maybe you better call a little farther. Maybe he's out for a walk. Elijah begins to mock him. And of course, the Prophets of Baal are calling with everything they have. In fact, in the afternoon, they begin to show how devoted they are to their God, that they begin to take knives and lances, and they begin to cut themselves and let the blood pour out because they want to show and demonstrate to the people and their God that they're serious. And they're praying with everything they have to their God, and the Bible says there is no answer, no response, not even a whisper. Wow, huh. And then Elijah, in the evening after all day, builds an altar. And let's look at number two, the victory. Elijah repairs the altar. Twelve stones, each representing the twelve tribes. He puts the wood and he puts the sacrifice there. 
then Elijah prays a simple prayer. God, let everyone in this place know that you are God in Israel and that I have obeyed you. And we know what happens. God sends fire down from heaven. It consumes the sacrifice. It consumes the wood. It consumes and burns the stones. There's not even dust left, and all of the water is gone. Wow. I don't know about you, but when you think about times and places you would like to be at in the Bible, that's got to be one of them. I would have loved to have seen that happen. I'd have loved to have seen that fire come down and consume all of that. And there'd be nothing left there. And all of the people find themselves going, we believe. Baal is not God. Jehovah is God. And before we move on to the lessons, let me just remind you about the incredible victory that happened that day and where it happened. It happened on Mount Carmel, that's okay. But it happened at an altar. You can't miss it. It happened at an altar. There had to be a sacrifice, and there had to be an altar. You see, the Bible tells us that sin has to be taken care of. It has to be paid for. It has to be atoned for. And the Bible says that God had one way that day, and that was to build an altar and put a sacrifice on it. Then God called down fire and consumed all of it. And God says to you and I, there's one way that God atones for sin. And it happens at an altar. It might be this altar. It might be an altar in your house. It might be an altar at work. It might be an altar at school. But I can tell you the altar is not necessarily where you are physically, but where you are spiritually. That you come to a place in your life where you realize that God can take care of your sin and there's one way he does it. And that was Jesus Christ coming and dying on a cross and sacrificing. We just sang about it. Jesus saves. It is the only way to heaven. It is the only way to have your sin taken care of. And if you're willing to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and you're willing to tell God that you're sorry for your sin, then God forgives us. He forgives you of all your sin. He cleanses your heart, adopts you as his child. The greatest victory you can have in your life is to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and to come to God through Christ the only way. That's the victory. But let's look at some of the lessons because this is my favorite part. Some of the lessons. The first and most primary lesson that I see in all of it is that it is amazing what God can do with one sold out person. I don't want you to miss that. It is amazing what God can do with one sold-out believer. We tend to think that it takes a whole church to raise, a, raise and reach a community. We tend to think it might take a whole community. Elijah is the perfect example that when one person is willing to sell out to God and give God everything... God can do the impossible through that one person. Are you willing to be that one person? Oh, it's easy to do that at church because there's other people who want to do it. But the question is, are you willing to do that when you're the only one who will stand up? At work? Your neighborhood? At school? It's amazing what God can do. You know, I, I'm, I'm amazed at how, how many people people sit in church waiting for God to change the world. Isn't that what we do? We tend to come to church and wait for God to change the world. I'll tell you another thing we do. We come to church and wait for the church to change the world. When Elijah's the example of God using one person to change an entire nation, that's an awesome lesson. Here's another one. I love it. In verse number 26, the Bible says that there was no answer, no voice, not even a whisper. 
Now, I don't know about you, but if you've read the story before, you have to know, if you know anything about God's word, you have to know what battle was going on there. See, if you were there physically, you'd look and go, there's, there's Elijah, he's all by himself, there's 850 prophets of Baal over there. Man, there's a lot of them, there's only one of him. And I want to tell you something, a hero do, beats incredible odds. But if you want to find a place in all of God's word where one person took on the greatest army ever, you find it right here in this passage. Now, I'm going to tell you, there's some great battles. David took on a giant named Goliath. Absolutely incredible odds against him. Uh, let me just tell you, compared to today, nothing. Samson. He took on armies by himself. Dude was bad to the bone. Chicken scratch compared to what happened on the mountain that day. Because you don't see a man named Elijah who has a sword and 850 prophets of Baal who had swords and they go at it and somehow Elijah kills them all with the sword. It doesn't happen that way. Because there's a battle going on on that mountain that's different than any battle you've ever seen. In fact, it is a battle that is going on in the spirit world that the people cannot see. Listen to me carefully. There is a spiritual battle going on on that mountain that day. Let me tell you something. Satan, all of his demons... You know what they wanted? They wanted fire to come down on the altar of those who worshipped Baal. Satan had the power to bring down fire. Satan had the power to bring a noise or an earthquake. And all of the demons of hell are there. And they're all wanting to cry out. They're all wanting to bring fire down. There's a spiritual battle that is raging on that day that everybody is completely unaware of. And I love it because as much power as Satan has, God can do the impossible. God is greater. His power is greater. And let me tell you something. God can even quiet the demons. I'm convinced that when Jesus Christ came out of the grave that there was an incredible spiritual battle that went on unseen. Satan not wanting that stone to be moved, we sang about it. Satan didn't want that stone moved. I'll tell you something. When God says the stone gets moved, the stone gets moved. That was an incredible spiritual battle. And the battle on Mount Carmel that day was absolutely amazing. You need to know that there's an unseen battle going on around you spiritually every single day. Every day there's an unseen battle going on around you. Let me bring it to you as an individual. Every single day and every single moment of every single day there's a battle going on inside you. Between good and evil between God and Satan. That battle's raging inside you. It rages inside me. Paul knew what that battle was. You've got a spiritual battle that's going on in your life, and it's going on in your life right now. In a few minutes, we'll have an altar call, and there'll be a spiritual battle going on in your life, inside you. You can't see it. I can tell you that as I prepared this sermon this week, I recognized the unseen spiritual forces, forces that came against this. But I love it. I love that the word tells us that not a single voice was heard from those gods. Not even a whisper. God had quieted all of hell and held them all at bay all day long.
I can't imagine what that spirit battle looked like around them, but whew, it had to be something. Wow. I love what it says in verse 28 that here's another great lesson. I'm going to tell you already, you won't like it. They had prayed all morning. They had danced and jumped around all morning, and nothing had happened by noon. That afternoon, they pray louder, they pray harder. And they begin to take knives, and they begin to cut themselves and let the blood pour and gush out of them because they want to show how dedicated and devoted they are to their gods. They want to show the people and they want to show their gods that they absolutely mean it. And they're willing to cut themselves and let the blood flow so they can show everybody and they can show their gods that they're serious about this. And they pray as hard as they can and they cut themselves. They do everything they can for their gods. It's one of the most incredible lessons and it's one of the most difficult lessons. And it's this one. We live in a sad society, and I don't mean worldly society. We live in a sad church society, us. And a sad testimony on the church today is that there are unbelievers in the world who are more committed to their lifestyle than believers are to their lifestyle. There are unbelievers who are more committed to their lifestyle than the people of God are committed. That's a sad testimony on the church today. It's a sad testimony on us. I know, I know unbelievers who are more committed to weekly bingo than people are to church. Isn't that a sad thing? Just use that as an example. There are more people committed to going to bingo every week than going to church every week. Let me carry it one step further. There are more unbelievers committed to going bingo then there are believers going to worship. We tell our kids, you can't miss a game, but you can miss church. There are unbelievers who are more committed to their lifestyle than believers are. And that's got to change. You wonder why the church isn't effective? And I speak of the local church, because there ain't anything going against the universal church. You want to know why the local church is ineffective? Because the unbelievers that live around us are more committed to their lifestyle than we are to God's lifestyle. What a sad thing. Well, let's look at another one. How many, are, how many want me to move on? I'll stay on that point if you guys want. Uh, now how many say, let's go on to the next point. We got that one. We understand. We're, we're guilty. All right. Okay, you're not going to like this one either. <laughs> 11 to verse 30. I read the story. I don't even, can't even tell you how many times I've read this story. It's one of my favorite stories in all the Bible. And they prayed all day long to their idols. Nothing has happened. They've showed their dedication and devotion to their idols. And finally in the evening, Elijah says, that's enough. And in verse number 30, the Bible says that Elijah called the people and he repaired the altar that was broken down. If you circle things or underline things in your Bible, underline that phrase, he repaired the altar that was broken down. It implies a couple real spiritual truths and lessons for you and I. In that one, it tells us that at one time, there was an altar there that was used. Listen to me. That at one time, there was an altar there that 
people used. And over time, they began to stop going to it. And eventually, the altar would just kind of fall down. Or, in this case, broken down implies that somebody came along and pushed it over, whatever. He repaired the altar. I got to ask you a question. How long has it been since you were at the altar? You see, you take one of the most incredible, interesting stories in the Bible, and then you begin to realize the truth behind it, the application behind it. And it digs deep into our hearts. That there are unbelievers more committed to their lifestyle than we are as believers. And I will tell you, it's easy for your altar to get broken down. The vast majority of believers I know, they don't wake up one morning and go, I'm done, and they push the altar over. No, I, I don't need my personal devotions today. I can pick them up tomorrow or the next day. Yeah, I, I, can, miss, I can miss worship. I'll catch it the next time. And How long has it been since you've been to the altar? Well, let me give you just one more. And this one comes really kind of out of our Sunday school lesson this morning in the book of Genesis about the, the high priest Melchizedek and Abraham, uh, Abraham meeting with him. I love in verse number 33 where he, he, he builds the altar, he lays the wood, he puts the bullock on there, and then notice what he says. Go and get four barrels of water and pour it on it. Now see, you read the story, and I know what you're thinking. Yeah, this is pretty good because... There's going to be no doubt, no doubt that when fire comes down, it's not going to be, well, I was there, lightning struck, and it caused the altar to burn. That's what it was. It was natural. No. I, I know because I've read the story, and I know it's what you think. He says, take four barrels of water and pour it on the altar. And they do. Then he says what? Go get four more barrels of water and pour it on it. And make sure you get the wood wheel wet, too. It even says that. And then he says, go and get four more barrels of water and pour it on there. So there's 12 barrels of water now poured on. It's filled the trench up all around it. The sacrifice, the wood, it's completely soaked. It's probably laying in water. It's completely water. And then Elijah says, God, it's time to show who God really is. But wait. But wait. I'm going to go back and share one really cool, kind of hidden away truth. It has not rained. L let me just say that again. It has not rained. There is little, if any, what? Water. And he says, go get 12 barrels and pour it on it. And they go and get 12 barrels and pour it on it. You know what lesson's there? It's kind of a unique one. I'm going to tell you what it is. People are willing to give to what's important to them. Water was life. Water was valuable. Water was everything. And it's amazing what people are willing to give when it's something important to them. Wow. 
And I don't know about you, but when I think of my time and my finances, I know. I know. We will somehow find the time and the money for things that are important to us. Oh, we may not get as much time or as much money, but you and I will find it somehow if it's important to us. So what about our time and our finances? Isn't it a great story? Well, you probably don't think so anymore. Lessons. As we close. I'm not sure how far you think you've gone from God. I know how far the Israelites had gone. But I want to tell you that God has provided the sacrifice to draw you back to him. God has provided salvation through Jesus Christ to redeem you, to pay for and atone for your sins so that you and I will have the opportunity to spend eternity in heaven. And if you're not sure that God's redeemed you, if you're not sure that God's forgiven you, if you don't know that you're going to spend eternity in heaven, you can. If you're willing to tell God you're sorry, Trust Jesus Christ as the way and give him your life. God will forgive you. God will save you. God will adopt you. I'll be standing right here at the front in just a moment. If you'd like to know more about that, a decision you'd like to make or questions you have, we'd like to take a few minutes before you go and share with you how you can know that. To my brother, sister in Christ, has been pretty simple and pretty evident. I don't want unbelievers to be more committed to their lifestyle than I am to God's. Maybe this morning you need to come to an altar and say, God, that needs to be me. Maybe it involves your time or your finances or your resources. Maybe you need to come and say, God, I have things I'm committed to, and that's okay. But not if you're more committed to that. Maybe this morning, you need to say, God, I haven't been to the altar in a long time. Would you bow your heads in prayer with me this morning, heads bowed? An incredible story, but really hard lessons. A hero that stood on a mountain by himself on that top of that mountain. knowing that if he failed and if God didn't answer, he would die. But he was willing to die. He was willing to give it all, are you? Father, I pray you'd bless our invitation time now. I pray that we'd be willing to be obedient in Jesus' name. I'm going to ask you to stand with your heads bowed this morning. Heads bowed as our instrumentalist begins to play. The altar is open. I invite you to come this morning. Come on. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for coming for worship today. We do have a lot of things that are going on. We need some help with tables and chairs when we finish. Choir is meeting over in the sanctuary as soon as we're done. Our event tonight will begin with dinner. If you'd like to have a hot dog and chips, 4 o'clock. Um, but then we're going to gather, head to our stations, and have an opportunity to minister. Remember, please don't park in this parking lot out here. Bring a flashlight and a jacket with you. And if you can't bring a smile, don't even show up. We need lots of good smiles tonight. A lot of things going on this week. Make sure you get a copy of our church bulletin so you can be aware of all of those things. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much for loving us. God, I'm thankful that on one day there was one who stood before a nation. And you changed the nation.
God, I pray that as believers we are more committed to your lifestyle for us than the unbelievers are around us. Lord, bless our time as we gather this evening and share your love. Thanks for your presence here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.